Today's the day we're going to finish it all off. We're going to finish off our circular motion gravitation review. We've already done our kinematics. We've already done our dynamics review. And we've already last week done our simple harmonic motion waves. So what you see up on the board right now, this is it for physics 20. We'll start off talking about gravitation, Newton's law of universal gravitation. Remember that corny little uh, exercise that I had you do when we talked about Newton's universal gravitation? Got to look at your neighbor, repeat after me. Remember that one? Um, the point that I was trying to make with that little demonstration that we did in class that day is that every two objects with mass have a gravitational force of attraction between them. Um, whether we're talking about an apple and the earth, as as is rumored to have been the case with Newton and his discovery of the universal law of gravitation, uh, whether it's between um, you and the Earth, whether it's between the Earth and the Sun, or whether it's between you and the person next to you. There's a force of gravity between every two objects with mass. And that force of gravity is found by this equation. F is equal to gm1 m2 over r squared. Now, we always put those absolute value signs around the F, meaning that uh, we're not going to get the direction with this equation. We have to figure out the direction some other way. But that's okay. It's not that hard, right? If you have two objects here, object one and object two, there's a force acting on object one. It's this way. We'll call that F21, the force of two on one. But there's also a force acting on number two that's this way, the force of one on two. And when we solve for this force using this equation, We've actually solved for both of those values, F21 and F12, because when object one applies a force on object two, object two applies an equal and opposite force on object one. So we don't get the direction from the equation, but we don't need the direction from the equation, because all we have to do is draw a little diagram, draw a little picture, and figure out the direction, knowing that it's an attractive force, always an attractive force. Now. We skipped fast one, the torsion balance experiment. Um, I should have listed that one second. That's why I skipped fast it. The torsion balance experiment is what got us the value of G. Remember um, that uh, Newton derived an equation here and knew what the relationship was between the force and masses and distance and so on and so on and so on. But he didn't know what the value of this G was. Sometimes I call that value of G a fudge factor, right? Newton knew that force was really, really closely related to M1 and M2 over R squared. But he knew there had to be a number out front to make it not really, really closely related, but to make it equal. He just didn't know what that number was. So Cavendish comes along and comes up with this number, this fudge factor that we stick in front of M1, M2 over R squared to make to make it equal to the force. And here's what this torsion balance experiment that he used to find the value of G looked like. He's got the, the ceiling or the top of a box or something, a string hanging from something, and a rod on the end of it. And that rod is balanced by having a mass over here and a mass over here. We'll call this one mass one. The other one, we don't have to call it anything because it's irrelevant, really, except for making sure this thing doesn't tip over making sure it's balanced. Now we're going to bring another mass nearby it. Mass 2 gets nearby it. And when we do that, there is going to be an ever so small, ever so tiny force of attraction between mass 1 and mass 2. In other words, mass 1 will be pulled towards mass 2. And what Cavendish would have done is measure the value of R the distance between the two of them, he would have measured the value of M1 and M2, and all three of those things are pretty easy to find, right? Pretty easy to measure. But he also would have measured the value of force. That's the harder one to find. The force, if you remember, was measured from looking at how much the string twisted. Remember the analogy that I gave you? You're on a swing set, and you know that when you, when you twist the swing set, is do that, right? Or at least you did when you were little. You twist the swing set around as much as you can, and then you let it go so that you start spinning faster and faster and faster. The more you twist it, the harder it is to twist it. The more you twist it, the more force is required. We can get a measure of the force acting between one and two by observing how much this string twists.
bottom line is we get a value of force. If we got a value of R, we got a value of M1, we got a value of M2, we got a value of force. Now we can just say F is equal to G M1 M2 over R squared and rearrange it to solve for G. So it becomes G is equal to F times R squared over M1 times M2. And when we get, we do the math there, it works out to be remarkably close to 6.67 times 10 to the 11 uh, Newton meter squared per kilogram squared. Now we've got our fudge factor. Newton knew that force was really, really closely related to M1, M2 over R squared. But now we know that it's equal to this number times M1, M2 over R squared. That's better than knowing that it's really, really closely related to this, this uh, equation, but that is, it's equal to this equation. Thank you. That should be negative 11. Thank you. That would be, that would be a massive amount of gravity. That would make you, if you weigh 100 kilograms right now, then that would make you about, so you weigh, I mean, 100 kilograms, we don't weigh 100 kilograms, but if we weighed 100 kilograms, most of us don't know this, if we weighed 100 kilograms, um, our, the force of gravity acting on us would be about 1,000 newtons right now. This would make it, it's 10 to the 3 newtons. That would make it about 10 to the 25 newtons, 10 to the 11. So instead of 10 to the 3 newtons, we'd be 10 to the 25 newtons. So that's not, yeah, that's, that's time to lose some weight if you're 10 to the 25 newtons. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's 10 to the negative 11. But the good news is it's on your data sheet, uh, and you get the exact same data sheet on your exam as, as we've had through the year. So if you forget the number like I just did, then just check your data sheet. All right. The next thing with gravity is this, this, this three object thing. What do I mean by that? The force between three objects? Well, it's, we have a situation like this. Um, object number one, object number two, object number three. I don't know. Let's say this is 10 kilograms, 5 kilograms, and let's say make it 4 kilograms. And let's make my distance uh, 0.5 meters. If it's in centimeters, by the way, make sure you convert it. Or kilometers, make sure you convert it. We don't even really need numbers there in order to show you what to do here. We won't actually solve this question. Maybe we will, actually. Maybe we'll take the time to solve it. We have the time, so maybe we'll do that. Let's say I want to find the force on number two. Well, we got to draw a free body diagram for object number two. And to do that, we have to look at what way object number one pulls number two. It's always pulling, right? Gravity is always pulling. Gravity never pushes. So if one pulls two, then one pulls two this way. We'll call that F12, the force of one on two. But three also pulls two. So three pulls two this way. Now, some of you are thinking, well, object number one is pulled by object number two, right? And object number three is pulled by object number two. Yes, they are. But we don't really care about those forces because that's not the question. The question says, what's the net force on object number two? So draw your free body diagram for object number two, and then calculate both of those forces. F12 is K, sorry, is G M1 M2 over R squared. 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 times 10 times 5 divided by 0.5 squared. Get a number for that. You know what? That's going to be your job right now, guys. Um, this side of the room, Nick's side of the room is going to calculate this number, okay? G times M1 times M2 over 0.5 squared. In this side of the room, you guys are going to be responsible for finding the other one, F32, which is G times M3, M times M2 over R squared. R this time being 0 0.25 meters. Don't forget to square it. One point three times ten to the negative eight raise. Thank you. And on this, do you guys agree with that? Yep, yeah, good. And on this side of the room, who's got it? Tony, you got it. Two point one times ten to the negative eight. Thank you, William. 
Um, now, what are we going to do? Add them up, right? F net is equal to the sum of the forces. F12 plus F32. F12 is a negative value, negative 1.3 times 10 to the minus 8. And it's negative because it's to the left, right? But F32 is positive. And we know that because we do our picture. If you don't draw your diagram, then you're likely to make a mistake here. This works out, by the way, to be 0 0.8 times 10 to the minus 8 or 8.0 times 10 to the minus 9. There we go, to the right, as its positive value. And then there were two topics, gravitational fields and satellites. A field is this area of influence that surrounds something, right? specifically a gravitational field, is a, is, a, is a sphere of influence that surrounds an object with mass. Things with mass cause a field. And the whole idea of a gravitational field is to explain gravity when we don't have anything to experience gravity. I should have put another thing in here, gravitational field versus force. Because a force of gravity is a push or a pull. It's a pull caused by another object of mass. But you need something to experience it in order to have to be pulled. In order to have a force, you need a producer and an experiencer. Now, Lana, but in order to have, but in order to have a field, you don't have to have anything to experience it. You just need to have something to produce it. If we draw a picture of a gravitational field, it's always, it's always going to look something like this because the field always points towards what causes it. You may have an experiencer out here, a ball or a pen or a person or a rock that's experiencing the field, or you may not. Bottom line is, if you got what's in blue, you got the field. If you got what's in green, you have the field, but you you also have a force. Now, remember, blue is the producer, green in this case is the experiencer. And we have two equations that describe this whole deal. We have our producer equation. And we have our experiencer equation. If we know more about this thing, then we use this equation. If we know more about this thing, then we use this equation. If we know lots about both, then it doesn't matter what equation you use because they'll both get you the same answer. In the end, the field caused by the producer at this point is going to be equal to the field experienced by the experiencer at that point. We're talking about the same field. We're just talking about two different ways to find it. There is the, the field. We'll call it the, the field. We can find the field by using information about what caused the field or by using information about what felt, what experienced the field. And remember, we've still got, we've still got this equation. This doesn't find us the field, this finds us the force between the producer and the experiencer. So to use this one, we need a producer. To use this one, we need an experiencer. To use this one, we need both. And we're not going to find the field, we're going to find the force. Just a couple words of caution here. With, with uh, this equation and with this equation, the value of R, remember, is always from center to center. So let's say you're finding the field strength um, 1,000 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. What do you got to do for R? 1,000 kilometers compared to meters plus the radius of the Earth, because it's got to go to the center, from center to center. Good. And then finally, this is it. A satellite is an object that orbits around something else, because of gravity. 
We analyze satellite problems by setting the centripetal force, that's the force that keeps it in an orbit, keeps it in circle, points toward the center of the circle, equal to the gravitational force, which is the force that causes it. You remember that centripetal force is not a fundamental force, right? It's not a force that ever acts on its own. It's not, a, it's, I was almost, I was also going to say it's not a real force. It is a real force, but it's not a force like gravity. Gravity is a, is a fundamental force. Right? Centripetal force is just another name. It's kind of like a, it's kind of like a nickname. Kind of think of it that way as a nickname. You got a force of gravity that causes something to go in a circle. Okay, let's nickname it centripetal force. Oh, you got a force of friction that causes a car to go in a circle. All right, let's nickname the force, the force of friction, the centripetal force. Um, you got an electric force that causes an electron to orbit the nucleus. All right, let's nickname that the centripetal force. The centripetal force is just another name for all of these other forces that are really causing it to go in a circle. And then we have this equation that goes along with that nickname. So that nickname, centripetal force, is equal to gravity here because it's really gravity that's causing the satellite to stay in orbit. F squared over R is equal to GM1 M2 over R squared. That's what we do when we have a satellite problem. Cancel out one of the R's. Cancel out one of the M's as well. What M did we cancel here? Cancel the mass of the satellite. We're left with the mass of the producer. So now we've got V squared is equal to G times the mass of the producer over R. And you can solve for whatever variable you're looking for, probably going to be V. Now keep in mind, because we're talking about uniform circular motion still, every once in a while you have to tack in this equation to something like this. So you might need to find V using 2 pi R over T and then plug it in to find the mass of the producer or to find the radius. Written response number six on your exam. Written response number six on your exam is something like this. Is more or less like this, a satellite question. 